Look at we are halfway through this beautiful week. It's amazing that um, so much different weather has come between last week and this week. We had crazy ice storms in Portland. It's gorgeous outside, which makes it a lot more difficult to come into this uh, this old brick dungeon that I have here and share with you some cool news. Um, first of all, I need to thank my sponsors, Five Star Guitars, for being with me from the beginning. They have been supportive. They have lessons. They've got repairs. They've got so much gear that's free of sales tax. So they're in Oregon, so there's no sales tax. And if you go to this link right here, fivestarguitars.com slash all access live and enter the promo code of all access 15. You're going to get 15% off all of the products that you see there. You're going to support them and you're going to buy local. They've got lessons from pros like Jennifer Batten, who just had this incredible guitar symposium this weekend. It culminated with this Q&A session with Dweezil Zappa last night that I was grateful to be a part of, and it was fun as hell. So she's got another one coming up in March, and she also has a deep dive opportunity for some uh, opportunity to learn how to get the great gigs. So go to guitarcloudsymposium.com and let Jennifer Batten know that I sent you. You know her from the Michael Jackson days and the Jeff Beck days, but she's now providing all these opportunities to become an incredible guitarist. So speaking of incredible musicians, man, this is cool. Um, okay, I told you about the news first. If you go to this channel, youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin and subscribe, You'll get to watch this archive later. You can also go to accesskevin.com to see an archive of over 150 guests that I've had over the past year. We hit the thousand subscriber mark the other day. So that really cool surprise is that uh, the winner, I'm going to draw a random name from those thousand subscribers, and you will get a prize package that I'm going to send out to you. You'll get a flock of seagull stuff, merchandise, signed drumsticks and lanyards and backstage passes and stuff. But the cool part is that you're going to get to host this show. You're going to get to interview a flock of seagulls. So come up with all your crazy uh, 80s anecdotes and uh, your 80s fun hairband wigs. And then let me have you guessed. I'm going to draw that number on my next episode, which is Thursday with Maury Brown. Friday, I've got a fantastic episode. Uh, you know what? So many cool things. Uh, I've got When in Rome, a band known for The Promise. They're coming on next week. I've got uh, some local artists, Michael Illa, who has this great single called Tragic. Great guests, great actors, great musicians coming up, but none cooler than the next one. This guy and I went to high school together in Montana. All of those formative times of uh, playing in band class and uh, pet band shows and going off on weekends and playing these smoky bars, this guy was always one step ahead. He was the guy that everybody in school knew that he was the virtuoso player. He had not only the chops, but he's got the personality. He's got everything you would want and a rock star, but he doesn't act like a rock star. I was blessed to get to do some gigs with him. We're going to talk about those. And you've seen him. If you're any kind of keyboardist, and you've seen him on YouTube. He's got thousands of uh, subscribers out there and lots and lots of videos. If you go to youtube.com slash groove window, you're going to see this guy, John Wilson. How you doing, buddy? I'm so good. Cool, Kevin. You, Thanks for having me on. It's great. Your backdrop is uh, much, much cooler, man. I love that uh, that vibe. I'm going to change the color scheme here. So that, no, not. Uh, um, let me ask you: Is are you? Uh, is that sort of ambient lighting, or do you have a green screen back there? No, nope, that is my uh, actual painted wall back there, and then I added the you know streamer LED strip lights back there to get the little funky glow. Yeah, man. And, uh, yeah, no, it, it works fine. The funky thing. Uh, you know, there were so many funk songs that I heard for the first time because of you, man. You introduced <laughs> me to a lot of that stuff. And I've had some cool gigs with some great players over the years that, um, you know, I, I felt like I was uh, I was a little bit spoiled because you and I got to gig only a few times together. But uh, guys like Rob Kohler, amazing bassist, and guys like you on keys and, and Lee Kohler, his brother, and uh, Robbie Johns and these amazing players. Montana was kind of a hotbed for crazy, wonderful musicians, right? Yeah, the per capita was insane. Like the, the quality to population ratio was just off the charts for some reason. I, I moved to Austin, Texas um, a while back and I lived there and there's a lot of musicians, but I wouldn't say there's like that many more great musicians. I was really kind of blown away by, by how great Bozeman's scene was when I was growing up. So we were, we were fortunate. Austin. Uh, when did you move to Austin? 99 back okay. then. And I've got three kids that all grew up in Austin and went to school there and, and did the whole 
Austin thing. So I, every once in a while, I was just talking about this with some buddies today. I, I was there long enough, 12 years to pick up a few, like I still say y'all and I say fixing to do this. And no, fix and to do. no. <laughs> I know. And from the month, you know, and I also say pop, like what, what, and you know, so I, I've got this weird hybrid thing, but the more tired I get, the more that little bit of Southern kind of slips out and my yeah, wife teases me mercilessly. That, uh, um, there's, I think some nostalgia to that area. I mean, Austin so much different than any other part of Texas. And I've played a lot of gigs down there. Um, I have a, a fun, a really fun Austin experience. We played at the four seasons there, um, just for this, um, fundraiser for music education. Awesome. And, uh, um, another classmate of ours that came up, I'll tell you, um, uh, was hopping in the, uh, the elevator just before sound check and Conan O'Brien steps on the elevator with me. And I said, no. nice. What are you doing here? And uh, he said, you're Flock of Seagulls guy. And I said, wait a minute. How do you? And there were posters of the band right outside. I had the big purple Mohawk thing going on. And he'd seen the posters from the show. And I said, you're not here for our show. And he said, no. I said, I'm, he said, I'm hosting Austin City Limits. He was doing a comedy tour. And he happened to be staying in the hotel that night and uh, said, you know, you want to come out, you know, after your show? I'd like to guest you the our thing. And um I said, you know what I'd love to talk to you about is that a mutual friend of ours, uh, Sarah Vowell, has been on your show many times. And um, so, folks, if you're watching right now, John and I, uh, we went to school with Sarah, who's maybe most widely known as the voice of Invisible Girl from The Incredibles. But she's also an incredible author. She's uh, she's won so many bestseller awards. And she was on Conan O'Brien. He said, more than any other guest, she was the most ubiquitous guest on the show. And what I told him was that the part that really stood out to me was that she was the first guest on after 9-11. So when the towers came down, all the networks took all the shows off, especially the ones that were shot in New York, except Conan. Conan wanted to go on and bring some kind of energy, some positivity and, and hope to write to the, to the American population. Sarah was the first person to come on. Wow. And she, she was, and while it was somber, she had, um, as you know, she's got spunk and it was really cool to see, how that representation of Montana was brought there with him, brought humor and joy. When I told him about that connection, he said, man, she's one of my best friends. I talked to her all the time. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a nice thing because like you, I, I love seeing all of our classmates go on to different parts of the world and affect people in a positive way. And when you and I became friends on Facebook, it was so cool. We hadn't talked in so long, but I saw, but your focus was about, man, let's just reconnect positively with everybody. Have our community be, you know, positive and supportive instead of being divisive. And, you know, so I'm psyched to have you here because, uh, cool. you know, like yeah, you've done you've done good, my friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thanks. I, I, I think there's some comments in there, which are it's easy to to single out the Sarah Vowles and, and you and people who've kind of gone on, found these audiences of hundreds of thousands of people. But I guess one of the things that I love more than anything is everyone else. Like everyone has their stories and their moments and their, as we reach the age that we are, you see this gray coming in in my beard here. Uh, and not as much as this, man. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. I, I should, maybe I should purple, purple. This yeah. Thing. Yeah. It works. But, but my point is the older I get, the less like celebrity matters. Yeah. I think everybody, is a celebrity in their own, like everybody's got their, their huge story of triumphs and pain and things. And that's just kind of goes into everybody. And if you just sort of step back and respect that, um, it just kind of equalizes the whole playing field and, and everybody's valuable. You know, I think, um, you're right. As we get older, right. That some of that's wisdom and maturation. There are some people that still might not see that, you know, they kind of take things for granted or they, they don't recognize it, but, I would imagine that you probably came to some of that realization as you progressed in music. I mean, you're, you had this incredible talent and you worked so hard at it when you and I were young as teenagers, right? When everybody was out partying on the weekends, John's practicing. I mean, this dude at the earliest age that I met you, um, you had not only incredible given talent, but I knew you worked at it like crazy and it wasn't something you squandered. You know, and I think yeah, you found every opportunity to play and impact people. So as you grew, developing an understanding of people, uh, respecting people, valuing them, uh, you know, it's kind of like you talked about the celebrity factor. 
I don't like to ever refer to people as fans. You know, if people come out to our shows, I, they're, man, if they've paid money and they've traveled and they've gotten hotels, to me, that's a huge commitment. And it's not fanaticism, it's friendship, you know, it's family. And, you know, it's part of community, right? So you've developed a community in, in Montana. Everybody respected you, revered you because you were talented, but you were also, um, you know, your personality was outgoing and, and friendly. When you get to Austin, it's kind of like a Nashville or a Hollywood, right? I mean, you've got to get in. There are some clicks. Was it tough to bring that Montana mindset there and break into the music scene? Well, here's 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 a wild story. When I so growing up, music was everything, and in Austin, I didn't play a single gig. I never played one show in in the entire 12 years I lived in Austin. Now, there's there's other factors there. I was raising a very young family. I was very new in a career that was just taking off in the in the tech world there and um and so so it just kind of didn't I didn't have the the motivation personally to kind of go try to insert myself into that scene. So I don't really know what the scene was um very much. And I and I guess the interesting thing about all that and this this sort of takes me back there there was a back at back in Montana when we were doing all those ski resort gigs. I was playing a gig at the cat's paw, which is just this rough and ready kind of bar up in Bozeman. I mean, it's a good place. People who might might know it here. But I played this gig and, and I played a bunch around town, just like like you did. And a blues guy came through, um, but relatively well known at the time, named Tinsley Ellis. And uh good player sort of thing out of the, I think he was somewhere maybe in the Atlanta area or Nashville or something, but he was doing worldwide tours. He was in Australia and, and Europe and a band I was in opened for him. And he, he basically invited me to join his band. All right. Okay. And on, on tour or for that night? No, for on tour to, like to go okay. join him okay. and, right. and, like pretty nice for my age, you know, my early twenties, pretty nice salary to sort of do these gigs and this sort yeah. of thing. It was, it was, a, it, it was akin to a break for me. Now, literally two years prior to this, I had met the woman who is now my wife. Uh, <laughs> okay. Congratulations. And, and so that was it. Just a defining moment for me is I literally had like, which of these things do I want? Do I want to, cause I would, I would have been gone. I would have had, you know, moved to Georgia, been all over the world. The relationship would not have worked or survived okay. that. And so I chose, Oh, I, I turned away from, okay. from that thing. And I couldn't be happier with that decision. Um, sure. just because I mean, they both would have been wonderful lives. Um, but it was a very defining point for me to sort of say, okay, I could do that. I've got the thing right there, or I could go this way and see what, what that brings me. And I raised a wonderful family and, and all of these things. And, um, it's been fantastic. And I think all things considered, and maybe this is self justification, but I just feel like I came out on the better end of that deal. I am not going to disagree with you at all, <laughs> man. You know, ha, um, people that are watching, most of them that watch the show a lot of times are musicians, right? So they've either done the lifelong career pursuit or they dabble in it. I would imagine every single person that is watching the show and might lead, lead into the chat has had relationships that have been damaged or somehow affected in a negative way because of their pursuit in music, right? Um, when you met your bride, um, I was at that point married as well, right? So I was with my childhood sweetheart and I met her in Montana in 90, or 82, I was 12. Um, we dated through high school, dated through college. We were married 28 years. Because she grew up with me and she knew about my uh, pursuit of music, um, I think, and I, I'm not speaking for her, but she knew that it wasn't that I was choosing music over her. It was that I wanted to choose that life with her and have her to go on, the, on that journey. Now, I will say, um, after the demise of that marriage, um, we, we made it a long time, we're dear friends. I look now at many years where that was really selfish of me, where she was unselfish. She, she took a back seat and she knew that music was a priority because it fulfilled me in that way. 
if you're in an opportunity right now where music is fulfilling to you and you've got a wonderful family, then you win, right? I mean, the whole point of uh, musical success or um, status doesn't really matter as long as you're happy, right? And no matter what you do, because man, we've talked about everybody has had that kind of situation where um, you've sacrificed one thing for the other. I, uh, I think more important than anything else is that you've left sort of a, an impact on people in a beautiful way. If you've got a family right now and they've seen that you thrive on music, you're an educator, you're a uh, influencer in a big way, and uh, and you're still you know a successful um, parent and uh, and business owner. Then uh, you know you're setting a great example for your kids that, that you can have you can have, you can have it all. How many kids do you have? I've got three, um, and okay. believe it or not, my it's going to date me here, but my oldest is thirty. Wow! Oh my <laughs> and, gosh! Uh, right? No kidding. Yeah, Where's he's your thirty. 30 uh, he is in town. He's he's here in Bozeman. He made it back here. Um, doing great. Um, wonderful. He comes over and hangs out with us. Not as much as we used to with the dang pandemic. It's kind of hard to see our kids as much. My daughter. Um, so I have two boys and and a daughter. And my two boys are both here in town in Bozeman. And my daughter's over in Missoula going oh, to school. She is. All right. She's a grizz. You got some cats and some grizz in the family, huh? Yeah. The, uh, right. Right. Um. You know, it's it's funny. Um, I mentioned just before we went on air that I've got an older son who's moving to Great Falls. I couldn't wait to get out of Montana, right? The day that we graduated high school, uh, my buddy Vic and a couple of other guys that we knew went to Hollywood. They went to the Musicians Institute. And I was so jealous, right? Because I'd grown up in the cabin in Bear Canyon out in the woods away from civilization. And all I wanted to do was rock, man. And so <laughs> they went. And uh, I remember people coming back, tail between their legs, uh, just crushed, right? Music industry was tough. I stayed behind, got my degree, and, and uh, you know, felt like I was kind of, you know, going half-assed at the music career. I couldn't, I would not have changed any of that as well. Um, I'm grateful for it, but it's neat to see things come full circle. My kid wants to go. He loves Montana, hasn't been dissuaded yet. We'll see how he does with winters there, but he's <laughs> he's sick of the rain. We're in Portland, you know, and he's, he's done with dingy gray. But how is Montana now? Because you've gone back after 30 years. Uh, how is Montana now as far as creative space? Do you feel like you can, um, um, you know, either using the internet as a creative space or do you have to, can you do it locally? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the most exciting things is your place really matters a lot less than it used to, especially if you're taking a little bit more of a an alternative path. Yeah. I mean, I love playing shows. You love playing shows. It's great to get out in front of a huge audience. But, um, you know, I also, and you kind of hinted at this before, my absolute favorite gigs to play are house parties where I'm on the floor at the same level as every the 40 people that are hanging out, like getting down. Um, yeah. For some reason, there's just something about being like almost part of the audience and they're kind of like part of the band and a thing that, that I just, I really revel in that kind of close knit thing. That being said, the one band that I still play in is a 70, 70s funk and disco cover band. Oh yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we man. do, we do one gig a year in November called Funk's Giving. And everybody that comes um, dresses up in their afros and their polyester. And it's a big costume 70s party, um, which is super, super fun. And it's a fundraiser. It's, we, every year we do it for a, for a not-for-profit in town. And But it's the one and only gig I play every year. I play one wow. gig a year. And we missed it this year. You meant like I missed my one gig of oh, the year, which was which was a bummer. Didn't do a streaming event or anything like that. No, no, it didn't yeah. do it because it's it's just there's an energy there, and we even yeah. in the band we we're 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 an okay band. Okay, I'll just put that out there. Yeah. We're we're not bad. We're we're okay, but it's all about the party and the fun and and hanging out and putting on these ridiculous costumes, and it just didn't quite. There's no way to capture yeah. that feeling in a, in a streaming thing, I thought. So looking forward to next year, hopefully. I was going to say, it'll be twice as impactful, right? Because people are dying to get out. They, they probably look forward to it as much as you do, right? Well, and I, I bet, I, I don't know what you're thinking about this, 
but after all of this, so we are going to come out of this, everyone. Oh, take yeah. hope, be yeah. uh, be strong, and look forward. We are coming out of this, and people are going to go a little bit nuts when they do. <laughs> I can tell you right now, those first gigs are going to be out. out uh, they're going to be nuts. Which I can't wait. You know, I, you keep seeing, uh, you know, stuff in the news about bands that might just throw caution to the wind and they're playing maskless events at, uh, you know, certain, uh, resorts in Florida or whatever. Um, and, and I've had a lot of friends going to do them too. You know, we've talked to, I, um, the beginning of the pandemic, uh, flock of seagulls got thrown a last minute gig to do the eighties cruise to Jamaica and the other, uh, islands. And we were booked for it for the next year anyway, but you know, this is uh, three or four weeks into March, or I guess the first week of March, and um, the money was crazy. The money was great. And, you know, you're getting paid to leave rainy Oregon to go to the Caribbean. But a lot of people not only didn't make it back uh, very well, some didn't make it back at all. And so, you know, as musicians, we kind of, uh, you know, we've all taken gigs for the money that we kind of regret. Were there any gigs that you look back on now and you think, gosh, man, you know, I kind of sold my soul for X, Y gig. Not really like, like selling out kinds of gigs. I think, um, I do remember an, okay. So I used to play uh, with this band down in Billings, Montana, which is down the road from us about, about two and a half hours. And it was a fun, super fun band that played kind of a weird, it was called soul brat. Um, back in the early 90s and uh you probably know these cats I clay well, green we... was the drummer um, we had brad edwards played oh, percussion yeah. for us yeah. um, okay anyways and and the band was like funk reggae ska like that kind of stuff okay um super high energy and we we got this gig booked um there's this little bar in billings called the western and at the time on one side was uh, an adult video store <laughs> and on the other side was another adult video store. Oh, right, nestled Blanked. cozily between the two. Right. And it's one of these bars that is like a big, long, single hallway. And then there's a bandstand kind of back at the very end. And so the bar is right there as you come in. And we're, we're there for load in. And we start bringing in this stuff. And there's just this line of cowboys sitting on, at the bar with their hats and their boots just watching us drag drag our stuff in <laughs> and i just remember distinctly this one guy it was straight out of the blues brothers we're like walking down here carrying drum cases and things and this guy says those don't look like country drums oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is soul brack oh yeah. man yeah i would imagine that would have been beneficial to have the the, uh, the chicken wire around that stage <laughs> for sure we, oh. well they turned out to just leave instead oh uh, <laughs> so yeah we we played to i think four people that night and uh, <sighs> had a blast and just played our hearts out and had a good time with each other because and it kind of brings us back that i mean I think some people play for the audience or the fame or the money or those things. And then there's people that play to play. Yeah. And I, you know, you're firmly in that category. And I, I like, like I'll play for nobody and just have a great time. And usually that's what I'm doing in my room by myself <laughs> anyway. So it all works out. Don't tell my boss that. Yeah, <laughs> that is how I feel. But uh, I am, um, especially now, right after a year of not playing, this was going to be the biggest touring year I've ever had. And I got used to it. You know, after my kids got older, I didn't want to tour when they were younger. And like you, I wanted to be responsible at home. I wanted to be in touch with my kids. And um, I'm grateful for having a lot of time off during that area and uh, that uh, era. And then now that the kids are older, I really depended on touring, not for the finances, but for the mental, right? The, yeah. and, um, and so being cooped up and isolated as a social person has been challenging for me, you know? I bet. Uh, and you're a real gregarious, outgoing person too. You know, do you uh, do you find that because you sort of self isolated by being father um, and business guy and not being out in the club scene, has it been easier for you to kind of handle being uh, just sort of withdrawn in the pandemic? I, I think I've been lucky in that respect, just just because of the timing of the whole thing. It coincidentally happened to overlap. I've worked remote um, for ten years now, so I've worked yeah. from my house forever, um, and so that that wasn't a big change. My kids, you know, once I, I kind of shifted into family mode, and then the kids sort of grew up and went out. 
you know, my, my time is with my wife. Like that's, that's kind of my social outlet and she's still here. You know, we just, if yeah. we're going to get COVID, we'll get it together. And <laughs> like she, she's your bubble. Right. And, and we share that bubble and it's just kind of been that that's, we just kind of hang out in each other's space and don't really need a lot of external things beside that. So we've been really fortunate from that sort of mental health state. And then both of us have, um, you know, I, I love doing, you know, videos and getting on and things where I can sort of do some playing and, and reach some people that way. And I get a little bit of feedback that way. And my wife has her sort of groups that are online, but for, you know, human contact, it's pretty much her and me. Yeah. Well, that's, that beats the heck out of me and my pug, but, uh, you know, he's my, my dog has been my best friend this year, even though I'm so close to my kids and it's nice to have him here. You know, my dog is, uh, you know, he and I are in the woods every day. Man, he's I a love cutie. Him. I've seen those pictures, man. Yeah. Edgar Allan pug. He's in here somewhere, but <laughs> you know what, rather than, uh, than show him off, I love that you've got this set up. Um, my friend Claudia here from Germany, she's at almost every one of these episodes. She loves live music. And I've been talking about how much I love watching your videos. If you guys watch uh, YouTube clips at all and you're into keyboards, you've got to go to John's channel here at Groove Window because he mixes stuff up. You've got like your your you know mashup kind of sessions. You've got your um, sessions where you're teaching people how to do boogie woogie stuff and funk. It's so awesome. But uh, I because you have the setup here, I'd love it if you wouldn't mind playing a little live music, man. Would you be up for it? I could do it. Yeah, let me let me tell a little story to kind of come okay. talk talk about where this comes from, and then yeah, I'll, I'll play through something. So so I I gave up gave up on the music career a little bit when I made that choice. And I started in, into tech. I was writing code and things. That's kind of where my, my career went after that. And was down in Austin. And I ended up working for this content company just as kind of the video scene was starting to pick up on the internet. And they were trying to make videos that were how-to videos of, of all types. They were trying to be this giant, like kind of what YouTube was before YouTube was a, such a tutorial haven. Right. And it was called Expert Village, and and it wasn't great. I'll, I'll tell you that now. However, something great came, which they they were doing this experiment, and they had the employees there, if they wanted to, go create some how-to videos on whatever they happened to consider themselves experts in. And I thought, well, I could maybe teach some videos on how to play funky piano things or something. And I made a little series of these and one of them got put on the front page of the site. Um, actually, once they kind of went to YouTube, I got featured on their channel wow. and this, this thing ended up with nearly 3 million views oh my God. Um, and people liked it and, and wanted to learn this thing. And it just kind of clicked with me that, you know, I've always kind of been into video and, and photography and things like that. I like music. I love education. Um, I love teaching other people how to play. I actually get more joy out of that than, than what well, I love playing myself too, but, yeah. but the two are hand in hand. And so I just kind of, something clicked that I could put all of that together and make these videos that people would hopefully like and learn things. I get to play. I'd have fun making these videos. So I have this channel on YouTube called Groove Window and uh, the links are there. If you head over there, Everything is original. So I write all the music. YouTube is super weird about copyrights eventually right. as you kind of get to this point. And, and I just didn't want to mess with any of that. So I always wanted to do, I would love to teach how to play well-known songs, but yeah. there's just logistics obstacles to that, unfortunately, that I try to avoid. So everything I do is original. And then there's sheet music for everything. There's backing tracks that you can download them at a bunch of tempos and play along. And then there's the videos. And they're just a bunch of fun. I, I mean, that's that's the secret in this is I write them because I love to play them, and they're yeah. just super fun. And then I put put videos up, and other people, you know, if they like them, great. If not, that that's okay. <laughs> so I love that they're backing tracks. I I have to download those and do some uh, play alongs. You know? Yeah, it's it's fun. The, the the I guess the big problem is they're they're fairly time consuming. They take me the way I do them is not very time efficient, and so. I don't know if there's anybody from from my channel in the chat, but um, I'm pretty slow about eking those videos out, and I have these big um, dry spells. But then they come back on, and, and it's fun. 
But with that in mind, I thought I would take one of the tunes from that channel and I'm going to play the backing track and uh, play along with it as if it, it was thing. But it's going to be live. So if I mess up, you know, that, that's how that's going to work. Thank you for doing this. I'm going to hop off here. Hey, John Wilson, ladies and gentlemen. That is wicked. Oh my God. That is so fun, man. If you guys are watching this and you didn't get shaken, man, then you missed out. How fun was that? <laughs> I see Ken Glenn is over here in the chat. He says, GW in the house. I, uh, Again? oh my God, this is, uh, this takes me back. You know, I was thinking, um, first time I ever heard chameleon was a new year's gig that you and I did at the country club in, uh, in Bozeman. I'll never forget how, much funk drums changed for me then because I was such a rock guy, right? I mean, I liked like a lot of different styles, but actually being able to play with someone who could feel it playing with you moved me in a way that I could play funk drums. And I felt, you know, like, well, I'm halfway authentic with this. I wasn't, but in my <laughs> mind, I was, you know, I, um, God, the, um, there were so many experiences from that era that were pivotal. They were formative. They were changing for me. Because right around that same time, too, I got to meet Chick Corea, you know, uh, rest in peace, Chick. Wow. Man, wow. I, um, in Helena, the Chick was playing with John Patatucci and Dave Weckl. I had never seen anything like it, the acoustic band. My dad brought me, and you've played a lot of gigs with my dad. Actually, I've, you, you've played more gigs with my dad than I've played with you. Or And um, yeah, so uh, dad, Jerry Rankin, if you're out there watching, he may be. Um, he, uh, he took me to, he said, you've got to see these guys. you got to see them play. So he took me to see Chick Corea. I freaked out. I ran backstage. I had to go tell them how amazing they were. Michael brought me back to the hotel. We talked for hours. And I remember just, you know, it was, it was a game changer, really. And it was, it, one, it was great that I was not afraid to make them approachable. It was great of Dave to be, you know, um, sort of welcoming. And he sent me this. I actually framed this letter. He sent me a letter following up on stuff we talked about. He mentioned back then. Are you uh do you party? And I thought he was asking me. And I said, No, no, man, I'm you know, straight as they come. And he goes, Well, good. He said, if you want to do this as a career, there's no way you're gonna maintain this thing in your 30s and 40s and do this for a lifetime if you're into the party scene. So that's not what it's all about, man. He said, I've been there, I've been there, I did it, and I'm grateful that I didn't anymore. But from that era, all these people came through, guys like Rob Kohler, right? Rob changed my life, brought me into a band there. And there were other musicians that we were in school with too, you know? Um, Ken Glenn right here, I'm seeing him, uh, Billy Figgins, and uh, um, a lot of the, the musicians that we went to school with. While I was intimidated by them, and, you know, I was kind of, um, I was jealous because of their skill and their ability to, uh, to navigate a whole bunch of different styles. And I was such a uh, an ignorant rock guy, you know, and I look back now and think how many more opportunities I would have had to play great gigs with these people had I been a little more open minded. So how about some inspiration for you? Like back in the day, I mean, your mom was a teacher, right? 
She was, yeah. But I, 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 I lucked out that way. My mom was a was a sixth grade music teacher, but super musical family. She she loves to tell me how she would play Beethoven when she was pregnant with me. And so I got some pretty serious like osmosis back in the day, like before I was even born, get, getting that stuff. And she used to famously at dinner drop the needle on some classical piece of music and then see if I could guess what it was. So she really? would just sort of quiz me on stuff like that, all in a like no pressure yeah. kind of way, just as a fun game. Uh, but that was that was a nice upbringing. Her brother is a guy named Eric Funk, that the maiden name actually oh. is is Funk of the yeah. Funk family. So that, I mean, what can you say? And Eric Funk is super um, involved in a bunch of things that affected me pretty deeply. I was a classical student up until I, I'd been playing the piano for you know five, six years. And I think it's really common to hit a little bit of a wall there. And so, you know, any viewers who are watching this, if you're at that point, power through that. Don't let that, don't let that get you off the horse. There's a ton of people in that like five, six year range that go, ah, I, I, I got to give this up to have more time for studies or track or, or whatever the thing is. And that's a critical time. So I'd hit that, that time. And my uncle, and I actually have this in one of my videos, the story, it's a true story. He was over for, I don't know, like Thanksgiving dinner or something at the house. And, and we were just, I was just talking about how I was a little bit kind of burned out on piano so he says, well, hey, come over to the piano for a sec. Let me show you something. And he sits down on the left side of the bench and had me sit down on the right. And he starts playing this groove in E flat. Now, let's see if I can make this happen. And he says, just play the black keys. It just happens to work out that the black keys in the key he was playing in an E flat, make an E flat minor pentatonic scale. And so you, you can't play a wrong note. And this was just, it just clicked something with me because I was improvising and making up music in this kind of cool style. And of course, he's a killer player. His, his piano playing is just super tasty. And that was fairly inspiring. And it just, I just took a, a hard right at that point. I still studied classical um, through college even mm -hmm. but my heart was really in groove and improv and and funk playing from that point forward god that's i i'm embarrassed to say i did not know that eric funk was your uncle that's Whoa. amazing wow that's so cool i um <laughs> you know uh, I, I see some other classmates here my christy it's really good to see you here as well um you know there were other people that we went to school with too that surprised me a lot of people moved here to portland right uh um so brett kuchera is now tony starlight he's out here and, and doing well uh, everybody's kind of gone on and they've found their own niche or you know they've made music uh, a part of their life that just uh, fulfilled them in other ways you know so brett or tony does this lounge act right so he does kind of a sinatra um you know crooner gig and a really great um little uh um uh, turn of the century, you know, kind of vibe, um, not turn of the century. It's actually sort of early century, uh, um, uh, flapper, you know, club, um, great cocktails, good food. Cool. And we need the pandemic to go away so he can go back and do his thing. But everybody that we went to school with has these stories about their travels, right. That got them there. You mentioned earlier that everybody's kind of like a celebrity. Everybody has a story, man. Of course, you know, no matter what industry they're in, what, where they've been, um, I would think there are some turning points for you besides the Eric Funk moment where um, you decided, you know, you mentioned one that uh, you met your wife, now wife, and um, were there points in Austin where you, because something had to have driven you back to Montana. Tell me about a turning point where you felt like, you know, this, uh, I've had enough of Texas, Montana needs to be my home. Tell me about that sort of pivot point. That, that was a long time coming actually. We, so first of all, I'm a mountain guy. Um, I love to hike. I went out this weekend in the snow and hiked. Uh, my wife and I do that all the time. It's kind of one of our favorite things. And there's just, I don't know, something for me personally, super restorative about mm. getting out, not just in like Austin, getting outside didn't do it for me. That outside wasn't as healing as the forest and the waterfalls and the mountains that I get in Montana. So I'm, I'm a little more drawn to that geography. That being said, my wife um, 
wasn't doing great in Austin. She didn't have a great network of friends, couldn't stand the heat. It was ridiculously hot in Austin, um, but painfully hot in the summer. We had, I remember one year, 40 straight days of a hundred plus oh. and it, it's just brutal. And, uh, she wanted to get back. I wanted to get back. It's always hard when you've got a family and we had kids still in high school, which is like the worst possible time to try to uproot people. Um, but we, just kind of made the call and broke and, and came back up here. And uh, I was fortunate that my company that I worked for in Austin was willing to let me go remote at that time, which was 10 years ago or something. And um, so that I, I was okay financially to have a, a job. That, um, I still work remote for that same industry. Um, and, and that all worked out well, but, but the trip back, you know, I, that's that's not an easy thing to sort of take your whole family. I know I know it was hard on my kids to sort of right. change all of their friends and and have to just kind of start over. My my daughter was like I think like a senior or a junior mm -hmm. like right there at the edge. It was just really tough on her and and it didn't work. Like when she got up here, um she ended up not finishing and went and did her GED as an alternative approach, which worked great for her. She's yeah. super successful now. She's going to college at U of M. But it was it was an example of, you know, the decisions we make have such an impact on those we're around and things like that. And that's it's just so hard to you. It, you when when your kids are little and and the problem is like. I don't want the red juice cup. I want the blue juice cup. Like I can fix that. Like I can fix yeah. that like right now when the problem is like all of my friends that I've built these relationships with are gone and I now have to start over. That's not a very easy problem to fix. Like once your kids reach that, like they have the same problems as me now. It's like, <laughs> so good luck. Hey, if you figure that out, let me know. Cause I probably have the same, same issue, but it, it, it was a, it was a journey for sure to come back. I'm I am very happy with the decision. I'm so in love with Montana and being here and the fact that I'm able to to work from here and and survive um is great and I can get out and see the mountains like I I would love to. It's a blessing. Oh, you know, it's really nice to bring some of your culture back to Montana again too. I mean, it's a rich a rich in culture place for sure, but that move that you talked about and the impact that it had on your daughter now, right? That this is a handful of years removed. Um I too had that kind of move right into high school. My parents moved me from Great Falls to Bozeman. And uh, I was with my girlfriend then and my best friends and moved into a cabin in the woods so far from everybody. And I was so resentful. But my dad had been a teacher, a high school teacher, and he needed to quit. It was so important for him to be able to paint. He wanted to go in the end uh, to the, the cabin and paint. His heart was drawn that way. And so when I look back now, I realize how important it was for him, for his state of mind. And I'm grateful to have watched that because I think I see how important it was for him to put his oxygen mask on first, right? He didn't want to throw you know, my feelings aside by bringing me to the woods. He wanted me to, he wanted to get out there and do what would fulfill him enough so that I think his, um, his mindset would still be an active parent. He'll be a lot happier person because he's not stuck with bureaucracy of teaching. Now for you, your wife, you, you recognize that your wife wasn't doing well there in Texas. Montana was calling you home. Your daughter may have been really frustrated by coming back senior year, leaving her friends behind. Did it give you an opportunity to sit down and talk about long-term? Was she at that point where she could have the long sighted view to say, I realized that this is what you guys needed to do. This wasn't right for me yet, but someday, or do you think that's going to come back after a few years? You know, all of my kids have, have turned into wonderful human beings and I would have that conversation with any of them. You know, we haven't though. It's interesting. We haven't kind of gone back and said, you know, I should tell my daughter that I feel some pain at having taken that action, which had was hard for her. Um, I think she'd probably respond to that, but I also know her and know how she would be totally supportive of that. And I think some things that are good have come out of this for her. And then I think she, you know, at the end of the day, it, we, we decide um, how we look at the world. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, somebody posted something on one of the social things that was just like, 
you'll be exactly as happy as you decide to be. Mm -hmm. And it's a just, LinkedIn quote. Yeah, and it just kind of kind of resonated with me because I think that's just so true. And and you you can kind of it's not it doesn't all just happen to you. You're actively involved in that whole thing. And not to get too like metaphysical here or anything, but I just think that there's a lot of things that people can do to decide to look at the glass as half full or half empty. If you can kind of put yourself into that half full spot, you're just going to be better off. You know, it's great to be able to have the perspective when times are good, right? You know, when we look at the political climate the last couple of years in the US and with pandemic, you know, it's really difficult sometimes to be objective and look at that. You know, that, that quote, I just wanted to make sure that I got that right. It was Abraham Lincoln said, most folks are happy as they make up their minds to be. That one for me was a, a really important one because when I look back at being in Montana in the woods where now I look back at where we were at, it was the most beautiful place on the planet. I would give anything to have that um, respite. It was peaceful. I could walk right out my door and get waterfalls and mountains and, and hiking trails. Now I've got a little drive to get there, but it's interesting that your perspective changes as we get older, you know, just the way that we talked about music. Um, I couldn't wait to get out and have music be the be all end all you, as you grew up and you took your piano lessons and you watched your uncle um, progress musically, you watched other peripheral musicians too, you know, guys like Rob Kohler and Lee and, and uh, Robbie Johns and other musicians kind of go on and do the Montreux jazz festival and do maybe more touring opportunities. Your perspective changes as you get older, you find out what's most important to you. At the end of the day, when we take our last breath and you look back in your life and you think, I did it for the right reasons. You know, as as you get back to your last breath, what do you want John John's legacy to be? I don't know about about legacy. Um, what do you want to be I, remembered for? Well, it's a, this is an interesting question, Kevin. Um, I don't like. I want the people that I interacted with to hopefully come away a little better for it. I think it's as simple as that. I guess I I don't I don't need to have a legacy or a bridge named after me or some congressional library in my name or anything like that. I have no I could care less about that kind of stuff. Yeah. But um, I also I, and the energy we put into the world makes a big difference. Yeah. And and I just like the story you told about your dad. Uh, another interesting way of looking at that is. He, he was not in a great place doing the teaching thing he was doing. And I'll bet he knew consciously or subconsciously that, that was going to impact you. That was actually going to have a pretty dark negative impact on you because he wasn't in a good place. Yeah. And so making those moves if they're needed or changing your perspective or whatever it is to get yourself to that place where you're generally creating more good stuff than bad stuff into your sphere of influence. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I could be remembered for that, just putting out more good than bad, I'll call that a win. <laughs> that's a, I, you know, as as stewards of the planet, right? I mean, that's one thing you would hope for. Um, you know, because we were in Montana, you love the wildlife, you love the the forest. You know, a real important thing to look at is that you bring out what you pack in, right? And so if you're out <laughs> camping, you know, I mean, really, that is the same kind of thing. You want to leave the areas that you're visiting better than when you walked in there, you know? So if you're finding errant, you know, there's extra trash on the side of the trail, you're picking that stuff up. I know that that simplifies a lot of what you're talking about, but at the end of the day, you know, the pursuit of, you know, stardom or money, you know, the, uh, the Yellowstone club branches, you know, up at uh, big sky or, or any of those things that you, you lose sight of the real important things. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to get to that point where, I missed out. It's not just smelling the roses along the way, but I, I missed out on the human connection. You know, I, I love that about touring. That's my favorite thing about touring is seeing places all over the world, visiting places that I've always wanted to, but making the, the personal connections. You know, I, I mentioned Claudia here in the chat. Claudia is in Bonn, Germany. She came out to her tour in uh, the UK about a year and a half ago. This wonderful woman has this salon in Germany. She brought her hair products to purple, do my purple mohawk in, in London. And she's one of my favorite people on the planet. I've really enjoyed watching her. There are several people that I've made connections with in music. I never would have met them had it not been that bridge that got me there. And 
when I look back at our time together in high school, it was so important for me. I mean, it's a pretty typical thing for a teenager. So important for me to be liked, right? All I cared about was getting some sort of recognition or, or respect or adoration from our peers. It was high school. I, like, it was right. high school, but you know what? But I held it for a long time. I think I went back to, uh, you know, Ken Glenn and I have talked about this. I went back to a reunion, a 20 year reunion with a chip on my shoulder. It was really interesting. I walked back expecting clicks to be there. Um, I was resentful because some people that I ran into said, oh yeah, we totally knew you were going to be a successful drummer. We were a huge fan of your playing. And I'm like, wait, what? No, like you hated me. And, and I held onto this chip and then you know, as my kids got older and I recognized how futile all that was and how silly and superficial so much of it was, it was great for me to be able to have that experience and go back to my kids and say, wait till you get out of high school to see how life really is. It's beautiful and amazing and magical when you get to travel the world. And I know that you, you can relate to this. Getting outside of our boundaries is so important to be able to understand people, respect people. And uh, I feel like you've done that you know, in a lot of your communication, both social media and your YouTube videos, you know, you break those barriers down. I mean, music does that anyway, but you're charismatic, you're fun, you're jovial. The posts that you put on social media are not divisive. Even though you might communicate your perspective, it's about bringing people together. And I, you know, it makes me really proud to see that in you. I'm not surprised by it, but uh, I, I, um, I'm just grateful to see that you're still out there bringing that energy, you know? Uh, I've talked more than I usually do, and I don't mean to. It's just been a long time since you and I have talked, you know? I know, right? I know. No, it's great. I, I actually, I was hoping, to be honest, I'm going to I'm give this away, that you would talk more than me on this. So I, <laughs> this is my plan. My master plan is working out uh, great. So yeah, you, your, your Jedi mind tricks worked. <laughs> let, let me ask you something I ask every episode, man. I want to know, uh, people that know John Wilson, what would they be surprised to find out about you listening to or liking? Guilty pleasures. Oh, there's so many. No, there's so much music that I'm 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 not embarrassed about, but but everybody would probably judge me for it. Um, I'm a huge fan of like '90s hip hop, all that okay. Snoop stuff, okay. and like I, I have you. that stuff all the time. But I also I kind of love Jurassic Five and sort of the sort of Tribe Called Quest stuff. So I'm I'm a, I'm big into People don't get the probably that I like hip hop as much as I do. Well, there's, um, there's, there's the funk derivative there. I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's that's in there. Um, I really have grown. I hated it in high school with a passion. Anything that I considered twangy, okay, mm -hmm. which was anything country, anything bluegrass, anything like that. I love that stuff now. Like bluegrass. I've gone to bluegrass festivals where I just sat there with my jaw on the ground the whole time because those players are just such monsters. And I'll put in a little bit of a thing here. If you ever get a chance in Montana and it's post pandemic and you go to the beauty, do not miss that. It's one of the coolest things because there's mute, there's blues, there's reggae, there's tabla, there's like Siberian knife dancing. Like there's every possible thing you can imagine. I swear. And it's, all awesome and and it's just kind of a life is too short to hate any anything i yeah, think um absolutely. and it kind of like and, and there's music that that even it's not my favorite music i've done enough music production that i can appreciate the like just immaculate level of studio work that went into like some of the top 40 stuff you hear which isn't probably my favorite genre but i like some of it you know that's sure. but i can appreciate all of it um for what it is and i just th there's almost nothing that you would say hey do you play this and i go yeah i hate that that's just oh. i just i try to it's just not a thing i i shoot for that transitions well into this next question. Then I would be interested to know. Um, you, okay, you've been you've been a music director for a bunch of gigs, right? You've been kind of the MD, sort of running the stage. Uh, you've got an unlimited budget, living or dead. Put together a dream band. What what kind of music? Doesn't matter. Oh, see, now that's that's tricky. And, and that is tricky because if they it wouldn't be compatible, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be right. Just, okay. Uh, okay. Your favorite musicians from each, uh, each, uh, instrument. They're not going to be just my favorite. Cause I don't have such a thing, but I'll just pick okay. some people that I totally love. 
and um, and we'll drop them in a band and see if that clicks with you. There's a drummer named Larnell Lewis, who I love. Um, He's played, he's out now. You can catch him on YouTube. He's played with Snarky Puppy quite a bit. Um, He's he's just a monster, Um, super friendly, um, likable personality, great teacher and things like that, which I like. So I drop him in there. I'm trying to think about bass. Who would I put on bass? What was his name from uh, Sly and the Family Stone Brown? Oh. Or um, he invented slap bass, basically. And I'm just oh, blanking. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank too, but okay. Just, so it's know, that Larry, guy. It's Larry Graham. Larry. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. He's on bass. And uh, I don't know how Larnell and Larry will fit together because Larry's such a funk guy. And I got to tell you, the bass and the drums, they've got a lock. Like, yeah. Like you can take the greatest guitar player, keyboard player, singer in the world, and if they're on top of a bass drummer and a, and a drummer that don't click, it it doesn't matter. It's not going to work. Larnell would bass. he would make that one because they, there's so much funk stuff in Snarky Puppy. He'd he'd nail that. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be fine. Um, g- guitar, there's so many. Um, I'm going to go back to i'm building a funk band as it turns out so i might have to swap some players out here i'm okay. gonna go right. nigel rogers uh from chic oh uh, yeah nile rogers nile, nile rogers yeah. um to just play funky rhythm because i just love that stuff so much mm-hmm. he's probably not the greatest like lead player maybe we'll have oh. stevie drop in stevie ray vaughn oh, on yeah. lead right um and and remake uh what was the David Bowie song that they were both on? Let's dance. I think they were both involved. Oh yeah, in Bowie. Yeah, like Carmen Rojas. Carmine Rojas was playing bass in that. Who was a guest of mine. And uh, yeah. but Niall uh, did the arrangement of that, mm-hmm. and Stevie Produced played it? played the the lead on that. That's so that's right. Many people yeah. don't know that. Check out Let's Dance. That's Stevie Ray Vaughan on on lead guitar. On lead, yeah, not the rhythm part. No, no, yeah. no. Um. That's Eddie Martinez, another guest of mine, a dear friend of mine. Eddie lives Whoa. here in town as well, as does Bernard Purdy. We have, we've got some some gifted players. Whoa. I was yeah. just like, I literally put Bernard Purdy on YouTube and just played along with him like three days ago because oh. he's a monster. He's like you. You can't watch him and not smile while you're playing. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, uh, and you mentioned Snarky Puppy too. I know their guitarist uh, is there in Austin as well. I, he was part of the, the Guitar Cloud Symposium last night with Batten. Uh-huh. And Dweezil, but the connections, anyway, man. Full circle. I, I'm I'm interrupting you. I, uh, I I'm not going to get to. I'm not going to finish this. I let's. Uh, there's just too many great players. So it, it's a it's a about, funk about, band with people. How like about a keyboardist? That. How about you're the MD and you you have to have another keyboardist come in. Well, I again probably not for funk, but Chick. You know, rest in peace. I I I mm-hmm. love his playing so much and and. Would love to have. I would just like to see him play sometime. I'm so you know blown away that you got to see those guys live and meet them. Holy cow! That that you, you were talking about formative things. That original like lineup of Patatucci and Weckl mm-hmm. and Chick Corea. I wore those albums out. Like I listened to all of them. I bought every single electric band album and that acoustic band where they never played the head. I don't know if you noticed that, but in jazz, yeah. the head is the melody. And then there's usually they play the, the head at the beginning and then there's a bit, bunch of solos and then they play the, the head at the end. That album, they never play the head. They just play the changes and solo. It's like just jazz music <laughs> for jazz people or something. But they're so in tune with each other and, and things. It was so... How about I'm not Stevie? building a very good band here, but I'm just telling you Stevie who some Wonder. of my favorite players are. Oh, Stevie. You? See, you're going to bl- throw me off my game I, here. Like, I can't win. Like, Stevie I, could sing, right? But And, and, and the guy with Jamiroquai. Let's put them together on oh. vocals and see how that works. Chris okay. And, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm stumbling here because there's just everywhere no, you good... look. Not to mention that there are probably 500 people right now on Instagram that right. would be just as good as that band. Like I, I follow people on Instagram where every day they just freaking blow my mind with how yeah. good they are. You know, well, there's a difference though between those people. I mean, there are a lot of people that are in their basements or their, their rehearsal rooms and they're killing chops or they've got such good feel, but there's something else about personality and vibe. I mean, we talked Bernard Purdy, not only can Bernard play like crazy, 
but he's infectious, right? He walks into a room and you feel it. I will tell you a Stevie Wonder story, man, that it that this is one of the only times in my life where uh, there's two parts of the story. Number one, it was at the NAMM show. You know, 100,000 people are there. It's ridiculously chaotic and crazy and not very fun a lot of the time because there's so many people. But Sunday afternoon, Sundays, that's when they close. Uh, Sunday afternoon, they close all the, the buildings down. Most people have been doing this thing for four days and they're kind of burned out and people leave after Saturday night. Sunday afternoon, I took my son, Caleb, to his first NAMM show and we're in the Roland building. It's, you know, Roland's got almost a whole wing in this one building. It's four o'clock, all the things are shutting down. Huge entourage walks in, security guys all around him. And there's Stevie he walks by. Before I saw him, I felt him. Wow. You could feel the energy in the room change. And I at bet. first I just thought it was because it was intimidating by these security guards coming in. And then I just, I was, I was stunned. And he comes right next to us, walks over, sits down at a keyboard, a keyboard, and they had, you know, area cleared off for him because he was going to come in and just play some jams and, and just check stuff out, right? As a, you know, as a player, Roland wants him to come in and just checking stuff out, but doesn't want to have, you know, crazy amounts of crowd around him. So he sits down and he just starts wailing. And my son, Caleb said, what's up with this guy? And I go, oh, this guy? And he goes, who's that? I go, that's Stevie Wonder. And he goes, uh-uh, Stevie Wonder's blind. And I go, I know. And he goes, that dude's <laughs> not blind. Look at, he's looking at his hands. And, I go, and he was he was so convinced that it was all a ruse, that it was a fake, that, that Stevie Wonder was never blind. And it, because... He could never play like that if he couldn't see his hands. That's what my son was thinking, right? My kid was 18. He didn't, or he's 17 then. But um, I remember, you know, very few people that I've met like that with energy. And that's why I was saying people have chops and they could play. But there's something about some of those people that were put on this planet that were made to do what they did. And, you know, for me, I mean, like Prince was that guy. Michael Jackson was that guy, you know, like, I mean, you could go through a list of like guys like the Chick Koreas and the Alan Holdsworth and, and all those people. I, um, you know, I was in Thailand a couple of years ago and uh, I, I hired this former monk to give me a tour of Bangkok with the temples. And I remember meeting these monks that had that same energy that Stevie had. And, uh, and it was strange, you know, because somebody like, it, I was very resistant to any sort of like religious overtone there. And I realized these people were just dedicated into bringing unconditional kindness and love to people. You know, I, I usually have my Mr. Rogers cup right here because he's one of my heroes, man. I think, um, you know, there's that kind of person, you know, would just like never judge, never, you know, uh, he could find positivity in anyone regardless of, you know, political stance or, or, or anything, you know? And um, so I think, you know, for music, that's a beautiful thing about music. You talked about not wanting to hate any style that takes a lot of maturation, you know, a lot of wisdom because you've been through so many different styles. You recognize the beauty in it all. It's an unconditional thing. You could find a benefit in any style of music. If you're like me, I don't know, when you go out and see a band, sometimes it's a curse, right? Because you've done so many gigs that you're focused on one particular thing, or if there's one thing that's off, it's a little distracting. Yeah, no, for, for sure. That there's a you talked about transformative moments, and there's an interesting one that I come back to a lot, which is and I, I hope this comes across the right way, but as I grew up and I learned more about music. I started to, I, I always trained my ears. And so I was always trying to like work out how to play things. And my wife always teases me because some song will come on and I'll sit down at the piano and play it just kind of from hearing it. But I've done that for a long time in my life. But it, it actually came at a cost, which is when I listen to something, I almost can't hear the whole thing. Like I hear, oh, did you hear the bass part right there? So, doom, 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 doom. Oh, oh, listen to that guitar. Oh, the, that snare is cranked up. Listen to the tuning of that. Thing. Like I just, I hone in on these little teeny individual pieces and I'll miss like the big picture. Like I don't, mm -hmm. like, I mean, I'll kind of get the groove or things like that, but I get so hyper-focused on a little line or a little chord voicing or something like that, that I actually, and, and there was a, a moment somewhere in there when I, when I changed and I, you know, I used to just hear music and it would just sort of come through. And I, I, it's really hard actually for me to just forget about all the details and listen to 
to music now. And uh, that's that's kind of a weird thing. I, I wish I could turn that switch off sometimes and just let it wash over me. I'm completely with you. I never listened to lyrics until a couple of years ago. Lyrics were the last thing I would hear. Same. Melodies were the first thing and the hook. And it's funny because people would say, oh, yeah, you know that one line in that song? And I'd say, well, mm, no. And I, I miss... Rep, I misheard lyrics a lot of times. I could misquote them because it just uh, was the last thing. Me but too. the cool thing about it now is that when I do listen, it brings this whole new appreciation for those artists that I didn't like before. You know, I was I was guilty of, I hate to admit it, I mean, there are a lot of people that would give me all this grief for like not being a Springsteen fan. And I saw him live and it blew my mind. Three and a half hours nonstop where the guy was on and he just had more energy than any 20 year old I knew. And after talking to people that know the show, every night's different. He'd do three and a half hours, but every set list was different. He'd walk in, he'd write it out in a Sharpie, tell the band, and he'd just call them out on stage. Whoa. And he and then I started listening to his lyrics. I thought, man, this guy represents the American songwriter. He's absolutely perfect for what he does. He's He was put on this planet to do what he does. And what a gift, you know? I mean, it's really neat to see that with so many people. I am. Um, I think, you know, I feel the same way about you. I mean, ever since, whether you're pursuing music as a financial career or not, look at what you've done, the impact that you've had and the influence you've had on so many people online. It's really cool because you're really good at it. Not only are you a great player, but you're so good at engaging people. But it, even if it's not live, I watch your YouTube videos and I feel like I'm right there with you. You know, so I encourage all of you guys, if you haven't yet, check out his YouTube channel, this Groove Window channel, because there's so much goodness out there. And it's fun, but it's also educational. Whether you're a keyboardist or not, man, you're getting a lot out of it. A lot of the things he just talked about, those little elements, I love watching you build those things, you know, where you build a piece at a time. And, uh, you know, you chatted about it. Um, I don't know if you'd be hip to it, but you mentioned kind of building on some stuff and doing some looping. I would love it, you know, if you want to wrap the show up with a little live music, man, I'd love to see you do one of your uh, your building blocks. What do you think? You bet, you bet. Um, so I, I again, a little bit of a setup here. I love to use these little loopers as a, as a kind of a writing tool and also just for fun. Like I just get a little drum loop going, I'll lay down some little bass part and then I'll just play over it since I don't have a bunch of friends to come over and sit in my, in my space. I kind of make my friends. Um, I create imaginary friends like, like we all do. But um, I knew I was going to be on the show. And so just the other day, I think Saturday or, or something, I thought, I wonder if I could make a little groove for, for Kevin's show. And so what I'm going to try to pull off, and there's going to be some things I'm going to try to do here that I will openly admit I am no expert in. And so it all, there's, I got to push 15,000 buttons in the right order, and it could go wrong. It could, could go horribly wrong, but let's hope it doesn't. And uh, here, here's a little thing just for you, Kevin. I love it.
dip jar oh, oh my god all right man the uh, checks in the mail my <laughs> goodness I, I have i have no words man that blows my mind claudia freaking, claudia stayed up in germany just for that that was incredible nice oh my nice. god i miss you man that uh, you too buddy I, the only thing i wish is that i could have been right back there playing drums behind that i know, you know? Right? I, know. I wish i wish the internet were a little bit better for latency because we could do that live That'd we'll so do that. Or maybe, maybe I'll send you some drum stems, man. Sweet, that was sweet. so fun. Cool. God, what a beautiful gift. That was amazing. The, uh, it's fun for me. I have a good time. So if, oh, if, whether you're watching or not, I'm probably going to do it anyway. Yeah, man. You know what? <laughs> I, well, this is going to make for a fun one because you know I'm going to steal some of that for uh, for the show. Welcome to I, it. I, yeah. I, thought, I thought of one last thing I wanted to ask you. and This is a super selfish thing for me. You played more gigs than uh, than anybody I know with my dad. Do you have a favorite memory of a gig with my dad? Let's see. It's putting you on the spot. I know. Well, I, I did play with him. And, you know, to be honest, I was very young at the time. When I played with your dad, I was still pretty much a teenager. And, yeah. we, and we were doing jazz stuff. And I think he was just one of the first, maybe, maybe the first, one of the first people that when i played that gig with him i was just like oh wait th this this is a guy who who does this and he's amazing like it just kind of set him apart into this like I, I had just played with you know friends and buddies and things and and i hadn't really experienced that real musician yet and he was one of the earliest people that fit that mold for him and i've always kind of hung into that and he was just such a you know you mentioned um 
the painting and the things that just kind of dripped out of him, that sort of creative energy. And I, I kind of remember that about him. I Good love guy. it. Man, that's beautiful. I um, it's it's really nice. I mean, it, thankfully, you know, Pop is still you know around kicking, and uh, it's uh, it's nice to be able to have these memories to look back on as uh, you know, as his legacy is being created, right? So I, I think about we talked legacy, and more important than anything else, you know, it's just the impact that you've had on others. I actually that's the slogan of my business. There was a quote that Jim Carrey had had in his marketing. Um, he gave this commencement speech to this marketing class. 10, 15 years ago. And he said, the effect you have on others is the greatest form of currency there is. And, you know, at that point, you know, Jim Carrey was at the height of his sort of popularity and success, but it was more than just making people laugh, right? It really was about having a positive impact. You've done it. A lot of the folks here in the chat that we've grown up with um, have done that. I'm inspired by a lot of you guys. This just made my day, man. That was a lot of fun. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. We've got a lot to catch up on. I know. We'll have to do it again sometime. It was so much fun. It was great. Thank you for we'll having me on. We'll do it in the same room. And, uh, you know, I'll wear a mask, whatever. But Yeah, uh, me too. Whatever. I really, man, thank your, thank your bride for sharing you with us this afternoon. <laughs> we'll and do. We'll do. You guys out there, thank you so much for being here. If you have not yet, please subscribe both to the Groove Window YouTube channel you see there at the bottom. And if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to mine as well. YouTube.com slash All Access Live with Kevin Rankin. I can't not hear that groove, that hook in there now. So, nice. John Wilson, thank you so much, brother. You, you guys bet. have a be beautiful week. And uh, I'll be back here on Thursday with Maury Brown. So thanks, guys. And we'll see you in 70 or 48.